And, be, and being a true gentleman, I may not tell the exact truth. Uh, we were actually reminiscing of when I first knew Trident. And we aren't going to go far into that, except he was the mere broth of a lad when I first started dating his sister, my wife. Uh, anyway, Gord went to both public and high school in Madoc, grew up on a farm just east of Madoc on Moira Lake where his family have been since 1870, 67. Um, and he uh, still hangs out there in the summer because he's got a very, un he and his wife Elaine have a very unique, unique cottage built by his grandfather on the shores of Wire Lake. Uh, so it is a pleasure. Gord, after high school, went to Queens and did a de his degree and uh, became a history teacher. And he was in Brighton, and then he decided, I guess wisely, against family's advice, you should be a teacher, because it's, and journalists get paid awful poor wages, but he went to Carlton, did a degree in journalism. Never looked back. After a whole lot of places he was, and he be, ended up as a, the senior business writer at the Globe and Mail from which he retired. During that time, he wrote nine, I believe, books, one of which was the 2009 Royal Bank of Canada Business Book of the Year, which is a very prestigious award. Since he retired, he has dedicated his interest in history to writing local history of his home area, Madoc. And we are delighted that he has done that because he had written a whole series of books about this and that and characters in the Madoc area. We've all seen, most of us, I would think, know about the Dale House, that mansion on Elgin Street. Tonight, Gordon is going to tell you the rest of the story. Uh, please welcome Gordon Pitts. Thank you, Grant. I'm glad I coached you on the usual lies. Uh, that's great. Um, and thank you all. Particularly thank you, Tammy, Leanne, um, Victoria, uh, people who, uh, who are the uh, core of the library here. And, uh, but also I have to thank a lot of the people in the room who, you know who you are, you helped me out on this project. So it's really a community effort. Um, what time is it right now, Elaine? It's five after seven. So try not to get to talk too long because there'll be questions and answers afterwards. Uh, we're all touched in this town in some way by the Dale House, right? Um, we know some something about the Dale family, about the Dale Bank. Uh, like me, we've walked by the Dale House countless times as kids on our way home. And I think my feet always moved a little more quickly when I uh, <laughs> approached the house because I tried to put that old house far behind me as quickly as I could. Um, or maybe we had our hair cutter styled at the hair spot downtown, uh, which is the scene of the Old Dale Bank. And in fact, you may have seen in the corner of that salon the old vault that was that hid so many of the secrets of the Dale Bank, which came abundantly clear later on. Uh, or we had ancestors. There are people in this room who had ancestors who lost money or lost face in the Dale Bank <coughs> fiasco. For this is the ultimate Madoc story of the people who made Madoc, of Rupert's and Connors and Nichols and Harris's, McBeath's, Murphy's, families with links to this bank and to this village who suffered through the consequences of its closing. And there are also people in this room who just find history fascinating, and I welcome you too. But before I start, I want to talk about a few people who are gone now, who have contributed to this story, probably primarily Gord Pigton, um, who preserved so much of the Dale story, um, who 
in those properties downtown, in the vault, which he cared for, and he kept in its beautiful shape it is today, and of his late son, Terry, who we knew, who left us recently, and of Diane. Um, and Gort has left me a whole trail of bread, historical breadcrumbs to follow that I can feast on. Brenda Hudson, whose sketches and words have um, preserved local history so vividly, and uh, Evan Morton of Tweed, Tweed Heritage Center, who, a giant in local history, left us recently. Slide two. Um, let's start. October 1914, Buffalo, New York, of all places. Um, the streets of Buffalo, it's fall, October. It's getting colder at night, and the wind is whistling through the corridors of uh, the downtown. And there's an elderly man there, drunk, raving, incoherent, classic sad case. His clothes were once elegant, but they're now ragged and worn. And the police bring him in as a vagrant, the Buffalo police. And he tells them he was once a banker in Maydock, Ontario. That he was once rich and important and beloved of his customers and his partners. He had a beautiful house, perfect children, and he'd lost his delicate wife eight years earlier. But he carried on and was admired far and wide. And these were all delusions, the cops figure. Cops say, this is just an old vagrant, an old guy in shabby attire with just a few dollars to his name and a whiskey bottle in his pocket. They've seen this type before. And if you look at the next, um, you'll see that J.C. Dale and all the wrong reasons became a big event in, December, in, in October of 1914 in Buffalo. Because the police figured out that his name was James Clapham Dale, the vagrant man. J.C. Dale, as he was known, 63, and he was a missing person on the police files, reported missing by his son. So the police trace him to a humble boarding house in the city where the old guy has been living with his son as his caretaker until the father escaped one night into the streets of Buffalo and the son alerted the police and they went looking for him. Next you'll see he was once a dapper man. We think this was possibly a picture of him not too long before uh, he tumbled into total ruin. Uh, I'm not sure it's him, but the Madoc Files, uh, library, library always tells the truth, it doesn't lie. It does look like him, but it's an aging um, J.C. Dale, and it's just before the fall. And in fact, he had been in mental and psychological decline for years. He just put up a good front. But now he is hiding from the shame of his financial collapse in Madoc. His son took him there to try to find treatment for his alcoholism and depression. And where is he staying? Um, this place, a uh, boarding house, rooming house in Buffalo. It's good old Google. I found the house that J.C. Dale uh, stayed in during the most wretched of his, uh, of his torment. And um, it's respectable, but I think a little small, not what he was used to. And uh, he probably had to share it with other working men um, who were, Buffalo was a very prosperous town in those days, and there were a lot of workers in the industrial city. Um, but at some point, after living in this rooming boarding house, the hallucinatory J.C. Dale ran away, ran away from home, perhaps looking for the home he had left just a few months before, the house in Madoc, if we can see that. And you know this house, the mansion in Madoc, the building that J.C. Dale had financed the building of in the mid-1880s, 30 years earlier approximately. And it really is the embodiment, the symbol of what he saw. He saw himself as a banker, as a retailer first and then a banker. And he operated the very successful Dale Bank from 1890 to this time we're talking about, 1914. Um, the house was the grandest in Madoc at that time, maybe now, built on a high southeast hill overlooking Madoc, grander even than the Seymour House, the other mansion of the time, or the O'Flynn Flynn House, a frame, white frame house, still standing on the east side of the village. It's built in the handsome Second Empire style, 
and it was a sight of elegant parties. Tennis matches on the lawns, afternoon teas under a canopy over here of maples and elms, and it was really an elegant place to live. And the police in Buffalo must have wondered what happened to this guy. What happened to J.C. Dale that blew his world apart? And his, what happened to his privileged life? What was he running from? And what terrible truth haunted him? In the end, they deported him back to Canada. Let's do a little background, though, now. We go to the next slide. Um, we'll go into um, J.C. Dale's background. The vagrant J.C. Dale is actually one of the, the sons of one of the pioneer families of Madoc. Arrivals in the 1850s, his father and mother, John and Susan, seen here. Uh, they really helped build Madoc from a rough-hewn mining town into a gem of a village by the uh, late 19th century. Bustling with shops, mills, prosperous farms, really prosperous farms, <clears throat> thriving cheese industry, and one of the most affluent little villages around this part of the country. And if you look at the next uh, slide, um, the Dales really made their home, their commercial home, on Durham Street. And the Durham Street, of course, was lined with flourishing shops in these days. There were no great fire gaps in those days. <laughs> and if there were, they were quickly filled up. Uh, so you can see some of the, uh, you can see the Connors store. You can see the O'Flynn's store over here. Um, you can see the medical hall where Johnson's drugstore eventually uh, landed. In those days, it was run by a man named C.G. Wilson. So it was really thriving. And just about here, beside the Connors, was the Dale Bank. And um, John Dale, the father, had been born in London, England. Um, he was a tinsmith, and he was a tinsmith in Maydock, and he grew that into a hardware store. And then he went into dry goods, and he occupied a proud position on this street. The Dales actually had shops on both sides of the street. They finally ended up on the east side, uh, the right side of the picture. And um, at various times, um, they, as I say, they were right beside the Connors hardware. And uh, just a couple of doors down from a store I don't see there right now, which is Thompson and Tufts Undertaker. So this may be not just the right time, but it shows you the general look of the street. And uh, basically, it's where the hair stop is. That was the bag. And right beside it, uh, where the Emporium, uh, the emporium is now. Um, it's called what's called the Old Dale Block. And uh, it's not very far from where we are now. The family dry goods store was taken up by the son, J.C., James Clapham, smart young man who upgraded the business from hardware and dry goods to banking. And he opened Madoc's second bank in 1890, before, long before he descended into the sad state he was in, in Buffalo. Next we'll see the man he followed, E.D. O'Flynn. The Dales really walked in the footprints of the O'Flynns, another grand family of Madoc. In fact, J.C. Dale's sister was married to an O'Flynn. But the patriarch of the O'Flynn fortune, the O'Flynn name was Edmund Duckett O'Flynn, E.D. And uh, he was a dry goods merchant who two decades earlier had founded Madoc's first bank. And people could own entirely banks in those days. Nowadays, you have to, you have to uh, I think 10% is the maximum ownership of a bank, a charter bank. Um, the Dales and O'Flynn's were among a small group of elite merchants who made a lot of money in the gold rush, selling, outfitting prospectors, thousands of prospectors in the 1860s, del deluged the town, and they were there. And um, E.D. O'Flynn was also an important Methodist, a uh, founder of really this church next door, which became the United Church, and as were the Dales, very prominent in this church that is next door to us. Next slide shows the man, no, shows you the ad in the North Hastings Review. 24 years, the Dales were known for reliability and providing a guaranteed state of interest, a rate of interest, 4% during much of the time. And that was just a little bit more than the chartered banks and the big cities paid. So they were highly competitive. And uh, 
They did well. They attracted more than uh, 1,400 depositors by 1914. 1,400 businesses and individuals had deposits there, including the most humble farmer, my grandfather, to the thriving new businesses like Whittock's, Connors, and Tufts. In Maydock, people got their start with a loan from Jason Dale. Many of them were farmers themselves, cheese producers in the cooperative factories of that era. There are about 10 factories in Maydock Township, about 20 in the general region. I would dare say all of them were customers of the Dale Bank. He was the farmer's friend, the cheese producer's banker. And that was the foundation of his wealth. Next one, indeed, he was a proud, dignified man. J.C. Dale, some people called him Jimmy. He's not a Jimmy. Does this look like a Jimmy? No. Too rigid, too serious. Nobody's, of course, smiled in these Victorian pictures, but J.C. seemed more serious than even the serious ones. Very elegant, his long suit jacket, looking off into a distance a bit, maybe thinking about the next loan he'd make, new investment, new venture, maybe looking west towards the prairies, the area of Canada that would prove to be part of his undoing years later. Next, you see the family picture, perfect family. His wife was the lovely, delicate Cecilia Van Cleek, originally, whose grandfather, Barnabas Van Cleek, was one of the earliest pioneers in Madoc Township. The Van Cleeks go back to the 1820s, ranking them with the O'Hara's, the Allens, the McBeaths, a little later, the Declares among the founding families. Her father, his father was Peter Van Cleek, who was farmer, MP, Reeve, jack of all trades, a go-getter, like his son-in-law, J.C. Dale. In fact, Peter would lend his name as a director to the bank that his son-in-law founded, providing credibility when it got off the ground. Next, you see a different, slightly different picture of J.C. Um, he became a pillar of the village. He was the backer of the lacrosse team. This is a big lacrosse team picture here. And the lacrosse team in those days was one of the best in Ontario, certainly uh, perhaps the best of all the small towns, small villages, in the province, in the province. And J.C. was a councillor, and here he is right here. In the, in the middle row here, uh, sort of uh, to the left, with his trademark little mustache. And um, he, um, he was also a member of the cheese board. There's a cheese board met every Thursday in Madoc to trade cheese, buy it, to sell cheese, and buyers would come in from outside and buy that excellent Madoc Township cheddar. And they would all be done on a Thursday night. Stores would stay open late on Thursday night in Madoc because that's when the guys, the cheese buyers were there. And he and Cecilia were both prominent in the Presbyterian Church like his parents were or the Methodist Church, that's a slip, it's an easy slip for me. Prominent in the Methodist Church, and he was the Sunday School Superintendent for 40 years in Madoc, the Methodist Church. Next, what happened though? Why did it all come apart? My book explains the rise and fall of J.C. Dale. Why it happened, the secrets he was carrying in his deranged mind, and in the vault, which is still here in Madoc, in the hair stop salon, a vault lovingly cared for by Gord Pigden for years. And the book looks at JC from three angles. The financial scandal and why it happened, the human tragedy of the Dale family, and a portrait of the town as it appeared, as it existed in April 1914 when the bank went bust. Now, what I'm going to do just um, for a little while, he was read part of a chapter, the first chapter, which sort of describes what happened. Chapter one, and here's how it goes. First chapter is called, Where Did My Money Go? On the morning of Wednesday, April 1st, 1914, the citizens of Madoc awoke to a nightmare as chilling as any they experienced in their dreams. 
It started with a crowd gathering on the uh, steps of the Dale House, the Dale Bank. And we'll go back just one for a second. <coughs> right around here on the, um, on the east side of Durham Street. And there was a notice affixed to the door, and the notice went like this. Payment stopped for 10 days. Depositors will be paid in full as soon as matters can be adjusted by order of shareholders, unquote. Nothing more. No further explanation. Some thought it was a cruel April Fool's Day joke, but others grasped the true and deeper meaning. The Dale Bank had closed. Their deposits were frozen, maybe for 10 days, but maybe forever. So they had to ask, where did my money go? Bank closing, temporary and permanent, are moments of harrowing panic, wherever they are. Whether it's the Silicon Valley Bank this year, or the avalanche of small banks that went bust in the United States in the dirty 30s. They create a chain reaction of uncertainty, dread, and sometimes deep economic decline. It was even worse in the years before deposit insurance. Now we get 100,000 insurance per account. There was no such a comfort in the Madoc in 1914, as news of the Bale, Dale Bank uh, catastrophe reverberated around the village's streets. It spread next door to the Connors Hardware, to the uh, Tufts and Thompson Undertakers and Furniture, two doors south, and where co-owners Everton Tufts, Tufts co-owner Everton Tufts, that's a good word, was counting his lucky stars that a, a couple of days earlier he'd gone to the bank, and it was the day before actually, and it was closed. He couldn't deposit his $75, and he was thanking his lucky stars that he couldn't do it. <laughs> It shook the confidence of the Whittick boys, Charlie, James, and Walter, because their family had very important holdings. They had the mill on uh, Deer Creek and the grocery store on Durham, approximately where the hidden gold mine is today. Well, where the hidden gold mine is today. And there was even a young Chinese-Canadian named Mark Tong, who worked in his uh, uncle's laundry on St. Lawrence Street, just about where the butcher shop is today. And he had saved up $23 in a Dale Bank account. The news spread along the concession roads, bounding into the side roads of Huntington and Hungerford. Jenny Rupert, a widow from north of Madoc, had recently lost her husband Willard and was selling the family farm. She hoped to support the five kids with the aid of cash from the sale. Her money was in the Dale Bank. George and Hattie Harris, industrious farmers, who through careful living, reputedly, had thousands on deposit in the bank, and that wasn't unusual. They now saw it all locked up beyond their gas grasp. Who knows how many people scanned that notice and saw their dreams go up in smoke of logging limits that could not be harvested, seed and fertilizer that could not be sown, store shelves that could not be restocked. One farmer, a cantankerous recluse named Walter Montgomery, who lived alone on the 10th concession of Madoc Township, must have felt exonerated. He had given up on banks, don't trust them, and he had withdrawn his ample reserves from the Dale Institution, preferring to hold his savings in a sack dangling from his neck. <laughs> Many of the bank's 1,400 depositors looked to the majestic Dale House on the hill seeking some response from the man who always had the answers. But none came. The house was dark, its massive windows without movement or light. There is no sign of the austere, dignified <clears throat> James Clapham Dale, known as JC. For decades, he had been the repository of Madoc's trust and goodwill. But JC Dale, majority shareholder, manager of the bank, had skipped town like a thief in the night. We know he went to Buffalo. He ended up in Buffalo. He left behind the dash dreams that he had nurtured and built among his loyal customers and his loyal clerk, Will McBain. As a crowd gathered outside, McBain watched nervously from his office in the bank like a man imprisoned. He was the bank's trusted employee, right-hand man to the Dales, and cast immediately under a cloud of suspicion. For McBain, the nightmare had begun two, two nights earlier, two days earlier when he learned that his boss, J.C. Dale, had skipped town. The banker's son, J.C. Jr., departed a day later after his dad's flight. 
McBain knew there were bad investments and tainted loans on the accounts, but probably he did not know the extent of the red ink flowing like river through the bank's accounts. The 30-year-old McBain had no signing authority, so the bank was left drifting. He had called in two minority shareholders and directors, Duncan McBeath and Duncan McKenzie, both prosperous farmers, to sign some credit approvals. They to look, take a look at the bank finances, cash on hand, and the empty office of the bank's boss, and they decided to close the bank down. There would be no run on this bank. The partners, who also included a young farmer named James Caskey, sought to quell the flames of panic. But in the end, they just tossed kerosene on the fire, and the panic was on. So that's the beginning of the Dale Bank. It tells you a little bit, without telling you the whole story, about what happened that April day, April Fool's Day in 1914, and why the Dale Bank and the Dale House are what they are today. The Dale House, of course, still remains. Just on the next, um, on the next slide, um, as I say, I explained in more detail about how it happened, why it happened, and the secrets that Dale, J.C. Dale had in his deranged mind. And then this vault, which you can, if the people are nice at the hair stop, they'll let you take a look at it. Cared for by Gord Pigton for years. The book tells the Dale story from three angles. A financial scandal, a human tragedy, and the portrait of the village in that decade decade and a half, between 1900 and 1914. Just up above, uh, just below this, um, we can see that the newspaper clippings in the next slide, it was a big story. The big bank goes under today is a huge story. It was back then, too. Put Madoc on the map for all the wrong reasons. There had been nothing like it since the gold rush of 1866. There, the drama of the financial settlement played itself out this is the Globe newspaper uh, uh, in, in April 1914. It played itself out on the newspaper headlines. And, of course, there were human stories also behind the uh, headlines. Elaine, the next one, I th there are people in this room that know this picture very well. Um, there were human stories. Failure deeply affected certain families in the area, and I've mentioned most of them, many of them. Mm -hmm. but deeply affected Margaret Jane and Duncan McBeath. Duncan had been a minority shareholder and director of the Dale Bank. The book tells of the huge financial hole that they found themselves in, what they had to dig out of, how they had to scramble and scrape to come back, and as you know, to emerge today as a uh, major contributor to our local community and economy. <coughs> the book is really an answer of how we got from the mansion, the perfect life, the perfect family, to that rooming house. That rooming house, again, I want to remind you, that little rooming house where J.C. Dale found himself after the collapse of his financial empire. <clears throat> after this fall from grace, he would never see Madoc again, but he would defy the odds if he lived another 20 years to die on the west coast of Canada. A man who was in that kind of shape and he lived another 20 years. It's kind of a miracle. The next slide shows you the house, of course, more or less as it is today, the house that launched a thousand stories, and we know it did. It had incredible mystique. Was it haunted? Was it haunted by JC? Was it haunted by Cecilia? By the owners since, some of the owners since then. And of course, not the Spatolas who own it today. We know, we see them. They're real corporeal presence. They're, they're real physical people. And we have to say thanks to April and Carl for keeping this um, beautiful house, a, a spectral presence in the village for the last two or three decades. Because the house looms so large in our imaginations. And I have some reminiscence of the book. Yvonne Healy, happy to say, contributed some. Jan Bruce, big time. And, um, and uh, Victoria Trevor, uh, one of the librarians here. And uh, they really informed me of what the hill had become. The hill 
had become, had a mystique of its own. Not just the house, but the hill. And it, unbeknownst to me, a country boy, it became, it was known as Maggie's Hill. And so I have a little bit of that in the book as well, the mystique of Maggie. To quote Victoria, if I may, Victoria, if I may, have permission. Um, it's in the book, so I thought I could. She writes that I grew up around the corner from the Dale House. I guess a bit east of the Dale House. And we were a stone's throw from Lakeview Cemetery. So you can guess the spooky stories that circulated around the neighborhood. Courtesy of our childhood reputations, or imaginations, I should say. Maybe reputations. The neighborhood kids, a group of five or 10 of us, on any given day, depending on who was grounded and who was busy doing chores, often rode our bikes up and down the hill on which the house was built. We called it Maggie's Hill. The story was that a widowed war bride haunted the upstairs room of the Dale House. In some stories, she had died young from a broken heart. In other stories, she was an old lady who still lived in the ten tenebrous halls of the mansion. Stalking the tenebrous hall, that's a great image. We often heard and shared stories of the mysterious sounds in the night and curtains being moved by invisible hands during the day. The adults said it was nothing, but I knew it was Maggie. <laughs> The house didn't do much to dispel any myths. It loomed over the more modern houses, as it does now in the neighborhood, in a shaded and unkempt lot yard. It was a game to see who could get closest to the house. I never stepped foot on the property, unlike some of the other people I talked to. <laughs> My older brother told me that someone told him that he knew someone who was walking behind the house on McKinsey Street, which is back of the house, barely more of the dirt trail at the time, and had seen a strange old man digging a hole exactly in the shape of a grave. My brother refused to walk that way ever again, and his fear was enough to keep me away. At night, at dusk in the summer, we would stand on the crumbling sidewalk and see how close the bats, hungry and active and ready to feed, would come to touching our heads. One evening, when the bats were sweeping low, several of us dared a boy to run up to the house and knock on the door. He did, and he came back screaming that he had seen something move inside. <laughs> You've never seen kids skedaddle back home as quickly as we did that night. <laughs> Sledding, go-karting, escapades in the house by some questionable people. In this, you know, it was all part of the mystique, and still is, of the Dale House. Next shows you something else. What of the, um, next slide, but what of the Dale family? They have scattered far and wide. I could, did track down one member of the family who lives in Halifax today. So we, I did what any journalist does, I knocked on her door. And her husband invited me in. For some strange reason, she was not really welcoming to me. So, but the husband was very welcoming. Nice chat. And he produced this ornamental walking cane with a prominent gold head. And I knew it immediately because there's a news story in the North Asian Review about that gold headed cane. It mentioned in a 1905 story, and it's a monument to the past glory of J.C. Dale. It has an inscription, quote, presented to J.C. Dale by his associates as a token of their appreciation for his able management of the banking firm of J.C. Dale & Company, made up November 1905. Nine years later, th this would have been a bitter joke for the people who had their money in the Dale Bank. So it's a symbol of human hubris, how the mighty fall, the horrible cost of families and communities when a good man or a good woman makes bad decisions. Next. Well, there has to be. A song, a poem, doesn't there? So if you can't read it, this is a bit of doggerel by an unknown writer. Jimmy Dale, oh Jimmy Dale, your little bank was doomed to fail. You squandered money in your till, and now your ghost haunts Maydock still. <laughs> Jimmy Dale, oh Jimmy Dale, a somber do truth doth prevail. If you bet with others' cash, your bank will perish in a flash. Jimmy Dale, oh Jimmy Dale, now we tell your tragic tale. A fortune won, and quickly lost, 
how Madoc felt the awful cost. Jimmy Dale, Jimmy Dale, I hear your cry, a plate of whale. From your soaring hilltop tower, all that's left of pride and power. I don't know who wrote that. A great writer, I feel. But um, somebody would put that to music, or we'll make a lot of money. <laughs> so what, where would you find Jimmy Dale today? James Dale, J.C. Dale? Not far from here in Lakeview Cemetery. And here's the great puzzle that I'll leave you with. He came home, his body carried home by train from the West Coast, where he died, to Lakeview Cemetery, where you can go and look at it today. Why? How? Well, he's not here to tell me why he made this decision. And anyway, with that, that is a very small capsule of the story of J.C. Dale. And um, I'm willing to take um, questions, if anybody, I'm sure. And of course, there are lots of books. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Great. I hope you enjoyed that. Anyway. Anyone have a question? Yeah. Why did Captain Lee made the same thing? That's in the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, for bank groupies, it's a great I got a lot of four or five things that kills banks generally. Um, risky stocks. They invest in it because they could. Um, Western farmland, which at one time was high but was going through a cyclical lull. Um, his own madness and is unable to manage the bank. And his investment in his own family's businesses, some of which went in. Yeah, yeah. So it's a common, uh, common problem. Because private banks, they don't really exist to us the same way today. They could just stay unregulated. They could do, they could invest anywhere they wanted to and nobody was going to call them to account except their other shareholders. And basically the shareholders were people who thought Jimmy Dale wouldn't leave the mystery. Yeah. Yes. Um, does anyone, I want to see signs if anyone thinks the house is haunted. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. And what leads you to that conclusion, Janet? Whenever I walk my dog by that house, he would scoot around and have to walk fast. <laughs> like me, as a kid. Yeah. Kim, you walk by it all the time. Yeah, but I, April asked me in for a visit. She did some renovations. And I walked through the dining room. In the 80s, there used to be this little thing that would sing and dance. When I walked by it sang and dance, she said, that hasn't moved in 20 years. <laughs> Does anybody have any ghost-like, other ghost-like uh, memories? Um, I always thought there was somebody in there. I don't think I saw anybody, but I just knew there had to be. I wanted there to be. Tom? That's where I, of course, I had to look at papers. A lot of people know that. That had to be the worst nightmare to go by that place that you've ever seen because you always saw there was somebody walking by a window or there was a light on or there was something. And when I had to go around the corner down to Joe Ashes, that scared the living daylight so, so you never you never dallied on that hill at all, I'll tell you. And of course then in later years you had the extra joy of having um, Maggie. Um, who did not like slaying down that hill, did uh, Yeah, what, what would happen, uh, Yvonne? Uh, she, she would throw ashes on the road yeah. so our bobsleds would... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was mean. So we didn't get I mean, it didn't get mean, clearly. Yeah, yeah. And when I was young, we never went to that place on the You didn't? No. <laughs> oh, okay. We all avoided it. I don't think the Spatolas are here. Gail. Yeah. There was a uh, time when we had uh, a chance to go through that. And I'll tell you, the view from that very top turret is amazing. It's been amazing. Uh, Jan and Bruce, I didn't see anything scary. Yeah, Jan Bruce has actually had a really great view from up there. Have you, Jan? What did you used to do? I was just going to say we walked all around there. No problem at all. It was like a roof one night. Yeah, you could, from yeah. the third floor, there was a hatch. 
get up there. And we had a ladder. <laughs> I was tall enough. I wasn't. Well, isn't it great to have a house like that that has so much lore and so much history? And it's right here. When our um, kids were younger, there used to be a bet because there was a broken window in the basement. Whoever could stay there all night, <laughs> I don't think they ever made it. <laughs> Sort of like Jan's experiences of it, and, 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 and uh, Yvonne's. I think, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So is it inhabited today? Like yeah, the Spatolas live there, and they keep it. Uh, they keep the tradition going. I mean, um, and thank God, because it's a, it's a big house. Yeah. They're not. Are they April here tonight? No, no. The inside is in good condition. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes. I didn't get inside. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I was inside maybe 20 years ago. Had a nice view from whoever owned it then. It might have been a guy from Toronto named Taylon or Tylon. Yeah. And uh, he was a, a repairman, uh, an electronics repairman in Toronto. And they came down weekends and summers and things. And occasionally, actually, I found an ad in the paper. He was selling electronic stuff out of the house. Uh, and I think he took me through the house. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe it was Carl. I can't remember. But anyway, yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. And incredible staircases and uh, the whole, uh, yeah, a true 1880 masterpiece, 1885. Questions? Any others? Now, the bit about well, how the bank went under is in the book. And fortunately, there are a, a number of things that have been preserved, including uh, the last audit of the bank, in which the auditors explain in horrible detail. And the McBeast will know this because you know, they were the victims of, uh, to a certain extent of this. Um, but the audit uh, showed where the family was making the bad decisions. Other questions? What time is it now? I've got to hold people too long. It's 7.47, Gord. Sorry, that clock. Any, anybody, I'm willing to sit around, stand around and talk. I'm selling more books. If you'd like them, and I'll autograph any books that are here tonight. Gail. You mentioned the display over here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, the library, Victoria included, has um, printed a bunch of things from the Dale Bank. Uh, there is a Dale current account, the list of the current account, all the businesses in Madoc uh, that had current accounts. The years uh, just before the collapse is really useful. JC, story in the Gilbert Examiner, which describes the house in some detail. And of course, the family and past books. Um, bank bank books from, uh, from that era. A picture of the Dale Bank and some. Uh, some uh, checks, some old checks, some cancel checks. And uh, the bank's uh, really lucky to have quite a bit. It's pretty rare, I think, to have so much uh, of a piece of history uh, to show people. <laughs> More questions? I'm willing to uh, call it at that and sign some books and have some coffee and uh, some cakes and things and maybe talk a bit more about the Dale Bank. Okay.